relational grace. How many have met Sally Sandpaper? How many know her? Okay. And no matter how long you get around her, she just rubs you the wrong way. And so we need grace for the Sally Sandpapers. Are you with me? And so with this thing called relational grace, if you're not getting grace, God's ability that works from your heart to enable you, empower you to do what you couldn't do in the natural, that's what I give the definition of grace, it's a gift, uh, you're not doing it unless you get it. So for relationships, i found, can be one of the toughest things that you need grace for. How many were around their family this holiday season? Come on, you needed God's grace to be able to deal with these people that are even closest to you. Come on, man, they, they know where to poke you. Nah, 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 nah. You know, they know right where to get you to stir you up. And so, God, we thank you for wisdom today that in relationships with others, God, this grace can operate. Amen? Anybody with me? See, relationships could be one of the biggest blessings in your life or one of the biggest curses. How many have seen that? Okay. And there are a lot of people that are in major defense and protection mode. They have been hurt in relationships, and, you know, you go to hug them, and they got their hand way out here, you know, hug me. And so what we've got to be able to do is trust God in these areas. We've got to be able to not be afraid of somebody taking advantage of us. You know, I had that happen to me by a 10-year-old, 11-year-old. And I, I just, this little person was trying to irritate me. They knew where to poke me. They just, and I said, God, what's the problem? And, see, and he said to me, you are afraid of being taken advantage of. Now, I had to get myself to the place where God was big enough in my life so that if anybody took advantage of me, because of him in my life, that's no problem. It'd be like, trying to steal Donald Trump's car. Would that bother him? It might be a little bit of inconvenience, but he'd get in the next car he had or whatever, you know. It's like we have to say, God is big enough to take care of me as some yahoo tries to take advantage of me. Come on. Now, it's one of the biggest curses, one of the biggest blessings, and it's an amazing thing about it that the curse of the blessing is not determined by the other person, but by me. What people do to you does not determine how you're going to have your day. It's your response to it that is. So what if we could get the perspective of Jesus that he had on the cross? Father, forgive them! The people that beat him, spit on him, cursed him, spoke every bad thing that could be spoken... Jesus was able to release that to God and say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You know, most people that mess with you, they don't, not only do they not know what they're doing, they're operating out of pain, but you really think it's about you. It's not about you. Somebody say, it's not about me. <laughs> they would do that to anybody that's in front of them. So we can't let it become about us. So I need your grace to be able to handle this, to do this, to walk through this, Lord, and so my response has got to be with your grace, okay? How many have had people, and the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and sometimes he uses you. <laughs> no, we need grace. That's not going to happen. He doesn't need to use you, amen? Uh, relational faith, me getting connected to my Faith through relationship with him, not mechanically. Now, I don't know if you understand how faith works, but I've been through it in every aspect, every group of people, every uh, camp. And I had the time where faith was about my confession, faith was about my believing. And you get to the place where it's got to be about what Jesus did and putting your faith in him. And so as I have a relationship with him, I find out I don't have a whole lot to do with it. How many have found that out? At one point, it was all me and what I had to do to make it happen to a place of, I said something about somebody over here, holy plops. God started visiting us 
for a season, and I'm, the season is going to keep going, of holy plops, where he dropped such a blessing on you that you had nothing to do with and you never could have figured it out. And if you'd have tried, you'd have messed it up. How many have had those things happen? Holy plops of God. And, and so faith is me trusting in him, knowing him that he always comes through, that he never lets me down. It's a relationship I have that I'm becoming so peaceful in, even when stuff looks like it's crumbling around me, I can just walk right through it because he's got me covered. How many want ready to go there? You have such a relationship with God, he never lets you down. He's not, he's not going to let you sink in the boat when the storm's going. You've got such a relationship with him, man, that he's got you covered. And you don't have to set, you know, I've had times where I said, well, you don't have to have these options in place and these things ready in case this doesn't happen. I've got to stay out of my logical mind. I've got to stay out of my reasoning mind. God, what do you want to do today? God, do you know it's getting closer when we need that money? And it's getting so close, should I start doing something to make this happen, God? How many have done that? Am I the only one? It got a little closer to when something was due, something was going to happen, and somehow it seemed like you were trusting God, but I'll help you out a little bit, God. Now, am I talking to the right crowd here? Or is this anybody else? So I've got to have, my faith has got to be through relationship. I've got a friend uh, helped us do a, a Bible thing, a home group about finances. And this was a guy, he's a, he's a self-made millionaire in the sense, but it's not self-made, it's God-made. Okay? And this was the first guy that I ever saw teaching on finances and growing them that did it all through just a relationship with God. I probably shared this with you maybe last year sometime. But he decided to go on a fast. And his fast was to not work. And most of us like to say, woohoo, I'd like to not work for however many days, a month, or whatever. But it was like he was a good worker, a hard worker, and he made a lot of money. But God had challenged him to go on a rest fast. I want you to rest and trust in me. Now, he still had to make some calls, and people would call into his office, and he had to return calls, but he wasn't actively going after doing business. And in a little over two weeks, he had made more than he'd made all the year before. Now, how many want to keep doing it? Or do you want to have such a relationship with God that he can say, hey, man, I want you to do this instead and watch me provide for you better than you ever could? Now, this is, we talk about the same God here, right? So if you want to make it happen, he'll let you. You know, we, we say the old sayings, when you work, he rests. Come on. And when he rests, you work. So I'd rather put, let him work and me rest. Come on, trust in him. It doesn't mean I won't do anything. I, have to, I do more things, but I do it with a rest and a peace sometimes. Are you with me? So... The law of the farm, you can't cheat. You know, we, we say, well, I'd like to have a miracle every time. So God, I'm just, no, we have to always be planting seed. We're always having to put the word in us. We're always needing to grow in relationship with God and put his word in our heart. You can't cheat the farm. You can't not plant something and expect something. In the natural, if you did that, if you... Say, farmer expects crop but does not plant seed. Now, if a newspaper got a hold of that story, you know, commit the guy maybe. What, what are you doing? You're thinking, no, we have to plant seed. We can't cheat the farm. So I've got to have relationships. I want to treat others how I would like to be treated. But I've got to relate to the ones around me with grace. It needs to be a lifestyle. Somebody say a lifestyle. I mean, relational grace is just flowing through me, working with me. Now, I just want to take a minute to look at the law versus grace or obligation versus a gift. The law in the old covenant is about what you had to do because we were under a different covenant. There were things you had to do, and you had to do them perfectly, and God had a blessing for you if you did. The problem was nobody could do it. Kind of a frustrating thing. And now we've moved into the realm of Jesus did it all and grace. And we still want to work to get what God already freely gave us. 
And so this same guy that I was talking to you about, it says, I believe a person comes into right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Come on. Somebody say believe. We got that little thing down there. But I, do I believe that? So I've got this right relationship. God wants to hang out with me, even though I've messed up and, and do mess up. But I am trying to get across to you that I don't want to get back into works mode under the law. If I am in that mode at all of obligation that I have to do something to get God to do something, I have just slapped Jesus in the face. I said, Jesus, what you did wasn't enough. So it's either all trusting in Jesus or all trusting in yourself. There is no halfway. There is no halfway between. the thing. You, you get that. So I am getting out of any obligation. You know, there's things you have to do. But I don't want to do them out of obligation. I want to do them because I want to bless somebody. Are you with me? This guy, when he would feel obligated to go see his own mother, you know, if I don't go see her, what's she going to think? What's my brother's going to think? He wouldn't go do that. He dealt with his own heart, with a relationship with God, and he wanted to go when he went, he wanted to bless his mother. He didn't want to do it out of obligation. How many have ever been through a situation where your parents were getting old or somebody was in the hospital and you had other siblings and they were keeping tabs on who came to the hospital or saw their their family the most. Anybody ever experienced that besides me? You know, well, how come you haven't been as much as I've been? Can't play that game. Come on. If I'm going, I'm going to be a blessing, and who cares what you think? Come on. But I did it six times, and you only did it three. Second Corinthians. This scripture is used mostly in the area of, of giving, and it's even talking about finances. We've all read it, but I want to talk about this in the realm we're talking about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting with 6. So we urge Titus to help complete your act of grace, just as he had started. But just as you excel in everything, how many like to excel in everything? Come on. In faith, boy, go oh Lord, I thank you for excelling in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we've inspired in you. See to it that you excel in this grace of giving, okay? How many want to excel in that grace? See, the point we're making is grace will empower you to excel in all these areas. It's not just one area. As a matter of fact, if you're only excelling in one area, you have to look back and say, is that me doing that? Or Because usually I need grace in the areas I don't excel well in the natural realm. And there's areas I do want to excel better in, and I found most of it, I have to deal with my own heart beliefs. There's areas where I have fear that it's time to replace that fear that I've had because of something that happened in my life with faith in God, that God, you got me covered. I've been in a two-year stint of having to trust God in a certain area that I don't have any choice. Don't bring yourself to a place you don't have any choice but to trust God. Start before you get to that place. God, I'm ready to trust you in this area and in this area. In this area I've struggled in, God, I'll trust you until it gets a little tight. No. God, I'm ready to trust you in that area now. And in this area of relationships, are you ready to excel in grace towards other people that don't extend grace to you? Remember Sally Sandpaper we started with at this thing? That person that's always there to rub you the wrong way? You know, grace can empower me with people that want to poke me, want to get at me. People, have you ever met people that are hurting so much that they go out of their way to try to make you hurt with them? Or try to make you obligated. Or, and, and they're hurting so bad, it's like this rejection is coming out of them. And in you, you want to respond to the rejection by rejecting them. Is this happening to anybody else besides me? And, and I, I see myself wanting to go there and you little blank, blank. You know, I'm thinking, you want to do that to me? And I have to say, God, help me excel in this grace to give it to others that don't deserve it 
and I'm way out of my league in me producing it here. So I need you, Lord, to empower me to love this person that seems to be unlovable now. Everybody can love somebody. You know, when Dave Duell would walk in the room, man, he'd have this smile, brother, how are you? Those that remember Dave, and everybody would want to go up and be around him. And it was easy to love Dave because he just loved everybody. And then I watched Dave one time. He had the grace to give grace to others. And we were at a full gospel businessmen's meeting, and I watched this guy over in the corner, and he had warts over his entire body. I mean, big warts and stuff. He looked almost something like out of a leprosy movie. And, and he was sitting over in this chair, kind of with his head down. You could tell, you know, he'd probably been abused his whole life, and people called him names. And all these people were coming up to Dave to, hey, brother, and getting their acknowledgement from him. And he saw this guy over there in the corner in that chair, and he went right over to him, and he stood him up, and he hugged him. Brother, how have you been? See, it's almost a little bit unfair. Dave walked in it naturally, or at least it seemed like it, amen, to do that. I need to have this relational grace, God. I'm ready for it to start functioning through me. That means I've got to give up my part of that and say, God, I need your grace with this person. God, this person that rubs me the wrong way. I want to be careful how I say this, but I had this little person I'd mentioned a little while ago that because of an environment they're in and their situation with their parents, uh, they have the, li- the, the way that they see things faith-wise and, and the way the social world works, they see it a lot different than we see things. And this person, somehow because of the pain they felt, felt like they needed to blame people. And let me say this about you, about your kids here now. Uh, We are in a society that psychologists, you, none of this is your fault. It's somebody else's fault in your life. That's what they're telling these people. Blame them. It's their fault that you're hurting. It's the biggest deception and lie. You know, I think about people like Robert Hall who've been around, worked his whole life, uh, He didn't grow up that way, man. If you wanted something, you had to go out and work, amen? And if you felt a certain way, you know, life gets tough. So what? And so we've got to be real careful about our entitlement mentality and how we're raising people. But when these entitlement people come and start pushing the right buttons in you, it it can cause some responses. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Don't you let anybody tell you because of your descent, color, way you were raised, whatever, you deserve this or this happened to you, forget about it. I'm going to be lifted up because I'm trusting in Jesus and that alone. Nobody's holding me down. Nobody is limiting me by what they say about my past, my parents, how I was raised. No, the limits are removed and they're removed from you too. I mean, all things are possible today because we trust in what Jesus did. Amen? So I'm going to move on, but we can excel in this grace in relationships with people, and I'm trusting you, Father, that I'm going to be able to do that, even with hurting people. Amen? Come on. Now, do I expect grace from others, but I'm not always willing to give it? Do I make decisions for others or give them the opportunity to choose the best way? You know, some of us have moved into a mode of control to protect ourselves. And we all control differently in different situations. Are you ready to release control of relationships, other people? Are you ready... Jim Richards said this one time to us. Am I willing to have a relationship with another person on the terms they're willing to have it on, or do I have to have it my way? I need you to be my, what's the BFF thing called? What best friend forever? You're either going to be my best friend forever, or I'm not going to be your friend. 
Or if another person can only do it this level, are you willing to have grace for them at the level they're at? Because they're hurting, they can't go any further than that, and you want to have it all or nothing. I'm telling you, we had to learn this the hard way. I tell my expectations with different employees. I have them repeat it back to me. Why do I do that? To know that they understand. So many of us just speak and talk and say things, and you think they heard what you said? I could be done saying a series of things and dates and what we got going to happen. I always have people come up and ask me, you know, when was that and what was we going to do? You need to get their okay, their expectation. Is that with me? Because this is part of this relational grace. You inspect what you expect. Do you inspect what you expect? Or do you just give somebody a list and hope that by the end of the month they got it all done? And they didn't get it done, and you're mad because you never inspected it. Are you with me? Come on now. Now, I want to move on here. Uh, in this scripture, and I'm going to read this to you. I might even have Denise read it because she's such a great reader. And this is a key part to this. Uh, this is a scripture we use out of Ephesians 5.18, and it says here, uh, Paul says, And do not be drunk with wine, for this is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Come on. Let's consider what Paul is saying, filled here. Nisha, would you mind reading this? I'm serious. You, you've got that kind of voice that's relaxing and people can understand. Oh, you want a bedtime story? Yeah. Okay, right here. Yeah, you start there. Let's. <clears throat> Let's consider what Paul is not saying. Filled here is not a word denoting quantity. Paul is not talking about how much of the spirit we have. He is not saying you're only half full like a glass of water and you need to be completely filled. Romans 8, 9 indicates that if you belong to Jesus, you have the entire Holy Spirit dwelling in you. How many you. got the whole Holy Spirit? How many just got half of it? And we talk about, God, give me double portions. How much more of the Holy Spirit can you get? You got the whole person, amen? <clears throat> Neither is Paul saying, remember how you used to get drunk with wine? Well, now instead of getting drunk with wine, get drunk with the Spirit. How many have seen those parties? Come on, though. Unfortunately, there are Christians who do this. They are so spirit-filled that they are like those who are drunk. They don't see, hear, feel, or enter into the pain and struggles of others. They are numb. Filled with the Spirit results in new eyes Come on. that see more, new ears that hear more, a new heart that cares more, and a new source through which we have power to enter into the pain of others and make a difference. Filled with the Spirit. Filled is the Greek word pleroma. Say pleroma. Almost sounds Italian. Which have a couple of meanings that apply here. First, it could mean permeated. Permeated is what happens to a glass of water when you drop and Alka-Seltzer into it. I remember the old plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is, and the whole glass would get filled with it. It becomes permeated. There is no part of the glass of water that doesn't have Alka-Seltzer in it. Pleroma is also the word that would be used to describe a sail when it is full of wind. A filled sail is what empowers or propels a sailboat. Now, this is where what I learned in high school physics comes in handy. It is not the wind in the sail that propels the boat. The boat is not pressed forward from behind. In fact, wind creates a negative pressure, a vacuum, in front of the sail. This vacuum is the force that attracts the boat forward. So being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean being power-driven through the Christian life as if the Holy Spirit were a locomotive wind behind us. Rather, it means being drawn into godly living by the Holy Spirit who is in front of us, focusing us on God. I guess God knows about physics too. Stop right there for a second. Are, are, you, are you getting a hold of this? I mean, wind is not pushing that sail. It's a vacuum that's drawing it. 
Do you know the Holy Spirit is drawing each one of us? Will we allow the Holy Spirit to draw us? We can learn even more about the meaning of a word by looking at its Greek form. In the case of be filled, it is in the present passive imperative form <laughs> for the scholar over there. Each of us, each of those aspects simply enrich the meaning. An imperative is a command. The one commanding assumes that you have the power to carry it through in your own power. But this command is given in a passive voice, which means it is not something you can do, but something that must be done to you or for you. Paul didn't write, get yourself filled or fill yourself, which is an active imperative. Instead, he wrote, allow yourself to be filled, which is a passive imperative. The easiest way to understand the present tense is to simply think of the phrase, whenever it is now. Thus, one literal rendering of be filled with the Spirit is this. Allow yourself to be continuously filled with the Spirit. It's not that something you should or even can do. It is something you should and can allow to be done to you whenever it is now. Let's look at that for a second. So, I can't do it. I choose to allow the Holy Spirit to fill me whenever it is now. When is it now? So as your day goes on, you're going to come across different people, different circumstances. Sally Sandpapers, Holy Spirit, I allow you to fill me right now <laughs> to deal with this. It's not a measurement thing. We've got the whole Holy Spirit. But am I yielding? We had that yield sign up a minute ago. Am I yielding to the person of the Holy Spirit in these situations whenever it is now? It's awesome. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. you, 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 am I done? Or do you want me to read that? Yeah, just, just finish to the end. It'll be great. Okay. So um, I've heard many people say things like, my wife or husband or child or pastor is a spirit-filled believer. In light of what we just learned, there's no such thing as a spirit-filled believer. If we remain true to God's word, it's accurate to say that there are simply believers who are allowing themselves to be continuously filled now and now and now. Woohoo! Therefore, it seems Paul's instructing Christians to enter the fight that is, in essence, of the Christian life. Get your life from God. Remain in a continuously dependent relationship with him in order to meet your needs. That's great. That's good. Thank you, Denise. Give Denise a what a making dreams come true right now. See, to do what we need to do in relationships with people that God put us in family with, we need the Holy Spirit. It can't be done any other way. It can't be done out of your I'm gonna this Christmas I'm gonna hang out with them and all not get in a fight. I need to allow the Holy Spirit to fill me whenever it is now. I need your empowerment to do what I couldn't do. See, the power of the Spirit is the only way it can work. Are you ready to go there? Are you ready to live there? Come on. Now, I'm just going to look at a few more areas just for time's sake. Uh, freeing a child's heart. Everybody say freeing that child's heart. Now... Come on. I decided I wanted to train her. This is a guy talking about his dog to train her to retrieve. So I, acqu I acquired a training video while the instructor shared. And this is a book called Families Where Grace is in Place. We got this a long time ago when we had our child. Nobody told us anything about having them or how to take care of them. And we were just, Lord Jesus, help us. And there's people that know. And so we had to read stuff, okay? I decided I wanted to train her to retrieve and acquired a training video. While the instructor shared my helpful training insights, many helpful training insights, one thing he said made the greatest impression. You don't have to teach a retriever to retrieve. Retrievers already know how to retrieve, hence the name retriever. Come on. I stopped the tape and thought about that. He was right. Mitzi was a retrieving fool. She already retrieved everything I threw out at her, and quite a few things I didn't. You have to create an environment in which your retriever can learn to be all 
that retriever is already is. Be all that you can be. Come on in God's army. See, with children, we're not trying to get them to do something they already naturally do. We're trying to find out what they already have built on the inside of them in their DNA from God. How can I help them do what they're already created to do? See, I try to get them to do things they're not really called to do, and I wonder why there's a problem. Parenting is not like training a dog, though some psychologists would have us believe this so. Training animals is mostly about behavior modification. Teaching them how to respond in relation to punishments and rewards. Parents, parenting is about discipline. It's not behavior modification. Say the word, modification. (laughs) Come on. It's about discipling or teaching children to make understanding choices out of wisdom. Yes, I do agree that it is necessary to create a learning environment. And this is the third aspect of parenting by the book. As Christian parents, we can best help our children by honoring their individuality, come on, and by building on the ways God has made them different from one another. Come on. How can we create family environment where children can become all that God has created them to be? Let me give you this little story, Discovering the Way. In northern Minnesota, there's an area called Boundary Waters, Canoe area. It is a place where it has been set aside by law by a preserved wilderness. Uh, Motorized travel, building, and logging is limited there. And it's a natural setting in which you can view a variety of animals, moose, timber wolves, loons. How many loons we got here? Come on. And I was floating around, and I watched it climb, I saw an eagle. Now, eagles have a way about them. Somebody say eagles have a way about them. So in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. See, eagles have a way about them. Have you ever seen weagles? Weagles. (laughs) Eagles, they fly and they lift, man, then all of a sudden they dive down and hit some fish, man, in the water and just pull that thing right out. They got a way about them. It's just amazing. But train up a child in the way he or she should go, and even when they're older, they will not apart from it. In the way is translated from these words, there are more literal say according to his way. Yo, yo, here we go. You always say according to his way. Come on, we're breaking it down a little bit for you here. Children have a way about them too, just like eagles. Now, what if we started creating an environment in which children could find their way? Boy, I wish I'd have known this stuff when I was raising my kids. Come on. The word that is translated train up in this verse from Proverbs is the word also used to describe a midwife interacting with a newborn baby. When the baby was first born in those days, the midwife would dip her finger in sweet grape juice or fig juice and massage the palate of the infant. Right? This would create the newborn an urge to suck. This urge is natural for most newborns, but sometimes they needed to be a little jump started. Okay? It, if you have ever had a newborn, but sometimes you have to, ru- excuse me, if I read this wrong, a newborn, you know that for a while sucking is what they like to do most. But sometimes you have to rub the side of their face to get them interested. Getting a baby interested in something they already have a love to do. How many of you think that's a great idea? Now you have the flavor of training up a child in his own way. I want you to understand that we need God's grace to raise kids. I heard somebody, it was Andrew Womack, say it's easier to raise the dead than raise children. But what if I could find out what they function in, what they excelled in, and just rub a little bit of that grape juice on them to get them jump-started, have the tools for them to find that out, 
instead of trying to make them do what they're not created to do, like the eagles created to fly. You think that could be some wisdom from the Holy Ghost? And this is, I'm going to just stop here just for time's sake. Uh, Father, I pray for these people. We have learned that the Holy Spirit is the only person that can help us with the relationships, to empower us, to love people when they don't seem to be lovable. God, we learn that the Holy Spirit is the only one that can help us with our children and our grandchildren. Jesus, we need your help. We thank you for your grace that you've already empowered us with, but we choose now to allow ourselves to be filled because it's now. In every situation, as the day goes on, Holy Ghost, I know you're the only one that can help me raise my kids. Holy Ghost, I know you're the only one that can help me in relationships with my wife, with my husband, with other people I have to deal with on a daily basis. So I thank you for that relational grace that you've already put on the inside of each one of us. We have that grace to be able to excel in these areas. And even people, I, I, it's almost like I heard this, I heard people say, well, I'm just not that way. And that's fear of something that happened to you. God made every one of us relational, but just a little different, a little way we approach it. Relationship is what we were created for with Him. So, Father, I pray right now for people that are out there that have been afraid to have relationships, God, because they don't want to be hurt again. But now they know, Holy Ghost, you've empowered them. There's a way about these people, God, in you that they can trust you with other people. I thank you, God, for wisdom. I thank you for strength. I thank you for peace functioning and flowing in them in the mighty name of Jesus. How many are ready to release fears, ready to release unforgiveness, bitterness? Right now, if that's you, I want to release that. I don't want to have any hindrances towards relationships ever again. That's you, you raised your hand, you asked me, Father, in the name of Jesus, we send those things away. Fears of being hurt again, we send them away. Fears of uh, unforgiveness, God, I didn't even know I had, I released that person. I released my parents, so maybe they didn't do this right. They probably did. We release them, Lord. I thank you today, God, I am free to do what you've created me for. And everybody in agreement with that, say amen.